Hi, I'm Kishore Hari. I'm the director of the Bay Area Science Festival at UC San Francisco. And I'm here to tell you about the golden age of science communication. There are more outlets, more innovative strategies, and just more science visibly being communicated broadly across the world. And there's a big appetite for that communication. But before we get there, there's science communication is one of those catch-all. It refers to a lot of different types of forms of communication. Academic communication, scientist to scientist. Journalism, magazines, long form, dedicated science reporters, policy discussions that include briefs to Congress, op-eds, uh, institutional communication, which includes press releases, uh, internal stories, press conferences. But the place I focus on is informal science education, which involves museums, exhibits, outreach programs from universities, live events like science festivals, science cafes, even science celebrities going on tours, and new media, including social media, uh, blogs, uh, YouTube science shows, that really increase a level of engagement in this, uh, in this form of science communication in ways that we have never seen. And in these last three categories, we've seen a tremendous growth over the last few years. And I'm going to highlight some of those. Before we get there, Scientists are already engaged in science communication. A recent survey from the AAAS showed 75% of their members have done some form of science communication. A majority of them had done some form of K-12 based outreach or some sort of outreach to the general public, which included writing. But there is barriers to this. Most of them report their motivation for doing so is to correct some sort of piece of misinformation uh, around science. They want to convince people that their position might be wrong or defend science in some way or just get people less disinterested in science. Those end up being short-term goals. There's a lot of social science work that indicates that the better investment is in long-term goals in, in terms of building trust with science, generating enthusiasm and excitement across many different publics, and framing discussions where science is an input. So what's happened in the education field is we've seen a shift from public understanding of science, where scientists push information out to many different publics so they understand science in much more detail, to public engagement. We're really bringing people in to participate and interact with science in new and novel ways. And that shift has produced an interesting continuum of events and strategies uh, that are changing the nature of what we see science communication to be. So I'm going to give you a few examples of uh, communication along that continuum, starting with the most basic one, a science lecture. That's really the currency of how science is communicated internally. But that's being turned on its head. Meet Shale Matsuda. He's a researcher at the California Academy of Sciences. And he does not like Shark Week on Discovery Channel. Shark Week is the bane of many different scientists because it has a lot of misinformation. In this particular year, they had run a documentary on an ancient shark called Megalodon and suggested that it might still exist, much to the disdain of, of shark scientists everywhere. So Shale came down to an event called Nerd Night, a casual lecture series in a, in a bar, and decided instead of doing a normal lecture where I'm going to present all the myths and the misinformation and let people understand uh, how what's happening on Shark Week is wrong, decided to come up with a novel tweak. He rapped about Shark Week, created an eight-minute rap that included myths about Shark Week, but more importantly, interjected his own personal passion for sharks and why they deserve our love and attention. It was met with a standing ovation. And this utilization of storytelling, uh, personal injection, of your own story has become more and more utilized in, in science engagement. And we even see shows like Story Collider, which is a science storytelling show, emerge on the scene with chapters in, in New York, London, Boston, and, and rapidly expanding across the country. But what if we could go a step farther? What, what if we could la add a level of interactivity where the audience actually had input into the science engagement? Meet Emily Grassley. She's a host of the incredibly popular YouTube show, The Brain Scoop. She takes people behind the scenes of a collection museum called the Field Museum in Chicago and shows them the personalities 
and preparation that goes into maintaining the museum and the specimens therein. And what she really focuses on is a high entertainment, high energy show that leverages all sorts of, of access and information that you normally wouldn't get if you just visited the museum on a daily basis. But the key part is because it's on a platform of YouTube, she uses social media and other platforms for the audience to really engage and drive what content she's going to produce and show. So now the audience has a direct input into the show they're watching, and they can access it on any device, whether it's a phone, computer, or otherwise, because it's on a distribution platform that reaches you everywhere. But what if we can even go a step farther than this? What if we can go from the interactive inquiry uh, in, through a device to actually bringing people to authentic locations where science is happening? Well, here we are at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. And the Las Vegas Science Festival took a number of people here to meet uh, the engineer that runs their incredible fountain show. And the idea behind this was, let's showcase that science isn't just happening in the lab, that there's multiple facilities out there uh, where science and engineering take root. And we got uh, to take a look underneath the fountains and meet the engineer who had numerous stories about breakdowns on how the machinery worked and how, uh, it, how delicate some of this equipment was. And he even showed us all of the coins that people throw in there on a daily basis. There's about 16 of the these buckets of coins that get thrown in on a daily basis. But what was amazing is the local population that came to this event had never thought about the Bellagio as a place where science happens. And now they left with a whole different perspective about that that was driven by that engineer. So location matters, and it matters a whole lot. But what if we take that a step farther to a place where thousands of people come? Here's a baseball game uh, that the Phillies were playing in. And this was during the Philadelphia Science Festival. They had worked with the Phillies uh, and Drexel to build a robot to throw out a first pitch of a game. And this actually got covered on SportsCenter that night, so it reached popular media. But what was amazing about it is after they threw out the first pitch, I was sitting in the stands, and uh, I was talking to a group of locals in front of me, and they were asking all sorts of questions about the robot. And I turned around, and there happened to be a group of roboticists sitting there. And they ended up talking for a couple innings about robotics. Strangers that would have never met anywhere else. But because these people came and engaged a whole sled of people at a baseball game, they're able to have a conversation that never existed before. And in 2014, almost 2 million people went to science festivals across this country. That really references that there's a huge appetite for all of this work. What if we went even a step farther than this? We've now taken people uh, taken science to where people already congregate. What if we actually bring in expertise from other areas so that science is sharing uh, and consulting with other different knowledge sets? Uh, and so science becomes an active participant in a conversation. Meet our scientist in chief, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He hosts a new science uh, late night talk show uh, where he intermingles comedians, TV icons, and scientists in a discussion about a broad societal issue. And this intermingling of pop culture with science is really interesting. A lot of different engagement programs now utilize this as a way of meeting their audience where they already have passion and interest. And what really happens is that science just becomes a singular input to a larger discussion. And within that larger discussion, we see a lot more eyeballs come to the table. But more than that, we see a lot more perspectives come. Uh, because science happens in the context of society. And this is just a great illustration of that in real life. But what if we go even a step beyond this? What if we don't just have scientists consulting? What if we have them, uh, people actively con contributing? This is the Legoscope project that uh, three graduate students here at UCSF constructed. They worked with the design firm IDEO uh, to bring together students, teachers, uh, designers to think about how they could educate people around microscopy. And after months of work and months of talking to people and understanding their perspective, they built a modular telescope or microscope built that you could construct yourself out of Legos and really showcased the process of microscopy in a whole new way. And it was really fun and engaging for a whole set uh, of youth. But the real impact of this is the idea of scientists reaching beyond their borders to people with other expertise that inform their work. 
And this interdisciplinary approach is what we already see in research. And now we're seeing that reflected back into engagement. It's no surprise. What if we even went a step farther than this, where instead of science leading the engagement, they were an input into it. All they did was help set up the situation where problem solving and curiosity could occur. Well, welcome to the democratization of science. We hear a lot about citizen science, projects and ideas uh, that are across a range that allow people access to per actively participate in the research process. But now what we're seeing is a twist on that, where science hackathons that bring together technologists and developers uh, and designers and scientists to work together on a common problem that they don't come in with a preconceived notion about uh, are emerging. There was recently a biologist from UC Berkeley, uh, Liam Holt, that worked together with a seamstress uh, and a couple engineers to build a mask that would mimic the feeling of synesthesia. Synesthesia is this uh, neuroscience condition. Uh, and what he did is he built a mask that had speakers on it that would help image the space. And the, those speakers would translate a visual of the space into sound and, and tactile response in this mask. It was an unbelievable hacked together project in just a 48 hour period. But what it really laid the groundwork for was a set of relationships that could actually inform science for many years to come. This level of continuum from going from lecture to interaction to location to real input uh, where science is uh, available uh, as a resource for everyone is really changing the nature of how science is communicated. And at the end of the day, the engine of this has been scientists. More and more across all of these events, scientists and engineers are the key factor that drives these. And there's increasing data that shows that their participation is enjoyable for them and changing the, the way they approach science themselves. In the end, the limiting factor is just the creativity of scientists. And we've seen an amazing slew of projects to show up over the last couple of years uh, due to their creativity. So I'm thrilled to think about what the next few years hold when it comes to science communication. Because if our limiting factor is the creativity of scientists, I'm optimistic that we're going to see new earth shattering ideas as we continue through the golden age of science communication. Thank you.